Awesome. Well, welcome to our Facebook Live event for the Limitless 2021 recipients of Clay Houston's Award for Texas BIPOC Ceramic Artists show. Uh, this is officially the first day of the show and it will be open through March 5th here at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. Um, this show is actually um, <clears throat> a show put together in part with Clay Houston, an organization that is local to help cultivate and promote and advance the ceramic arts in Houston, Texas through membership, education, exhibitions, and more. So the award recipients for this particular award are Tammy Rubin, G.A. Hahn, and Ernest Snell. So unfortunately, Ernest couldn't be with us here today, but Tammy and G.A. are here to tour the space with us and answer any questions that we might have for them. So Tammy, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then G.A., you can introduce yourself after. Hi, hello. So I'm Tammy Rubin. Um, I'm an artist who currently lives in um, Austin, Texas, and um, I'm a ceramic sculptor. I um, teach, I'm a professor of ceramics and sculpture at St. Edwards University. Um, and I'm really happy to have this conversation um, and thankful to Clay Houston. Hi, my name is Jihye Han, and I just earned my MFA uh, from University of North Texas. And I'm working with the clay mainly, but I really love to work with the mixed media as well. And thank you for giving me this great opportunity. Thank you. Awesome, I'm so glad both of you are here. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Sydney Pickens. I am the curatorial fellow here at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And this is the first exhibition I'm putting together here at the center. So I'm very excited to have everyone here. And um, we're actually about to, uh, switch cameras and then learn a little bit more about the space. Awesome. So stay tuned. Great. So before we go around the space, I just wanted to ask Tammy and GA, um, what has this award done for you and how has it affected your career and personal life? So I guess I can, I'll start. Um, sure. um, you know, although I don't make, uh, make work for acknowledgement, it is nice to be acknowledged. Um, and I feel like there's also, to me, um, as someone who has graduated a long time ago at this point, um, it's really good to see like this kind of hopefulness or uh, wishfulness about uh, the future of organizations. Because I definitely remember, like I, you know, I feel like that this idea of acknowledgement of really um, expanding communities, expanding the ceramics community, craft communities, um, and acknowledging um, that maybe institutions haven't always done the best best job of um, in being inclusive in those organizations. And so when I see a thing like this, I look at the jurors, I look at the strides that an organization like Clay Houston is making and um, other organizations, and I hope other organizations who have not done so will continue to do so to make sure that artists feel um, who are working out there don't feel isolated and excluded and understand that there is a community for them. So, oh, and awesome. then of course, let's just think tangible. Um, being an artist costs money. <laughs> you have to buy supplies. <laughs> you have to rent a studio. There's equipment. Um, specifically in areas like ceramics, there is a you know a threshold of the money that you need to spend to create your art, and that is always extremely helpful to have um, acknowledgement through a monetary means. So, awesome. That's a great answer, Tammy. Uh, Ga, what is your opinion? Uh, this award has made me more confident and ready to take on challenge both professionally and personally. I believe this great opportunity of being uh, the greatest um, amount of influence and connection to develop community and to bring to center stage the speci a specific topic such as like cross-cultural aspect, discrimination experience, systemic racism, historical and contemporary narrative of immigration and etc. Okay, great. So considering all of those things, and you know, you said that this award has brought you more confidence, 
GA, do you feel like um, there have been a lot of challenges that you faced throughout your career because of your status as a, a BIPOC individual? Uh, I think, of course, as a you know, BIPOC artist, it's really challenge in art field because, and I think artists need to continue to challenge the system responsibility, responsibility, responsible for inequality. It is mm -hmm. essential the artists extend the like metaphorical hand to speak our voice and to continue to uh, progress beyond the current situation. So I hope that the diverse audience of viewer can relate to my work and develop a conversation about stereotype and equality within field of ceramics. Yeah, definitely. And then Tammy, what kind of challenges do you feel you may have faced as a BIPOC artist? You know, I think that the um, this idea of otherness or being the only or not having um, references um, at hand to artists who are working in ceramics. So, you know, um, when I was undergrad, the, you know, if I went to my art, I, I not only um, got my degree in, in ceramics, but also in art history. And so, you know, it's attending a lot of classes of not seeing um, an acknowledgement of BIPOC artists, but even and women artists, um, quite yeah. frankly. And so it really comes down to um, my professor in undergrad wrote Ron Kovach, who was a, a white male of Polish descent. Um, when he would give presentations, uh, I think at some point it clicked for him that he needed to um, speak to his students directly. Like, who is in your classroom? What is their makeup? Um, and mm -hmm. I remember him very specifically bringing Patty Ward and Sheena to me because I was like, well, where are the women? Like, this is like Peter Bocas is great, but like, what? Yeah. That's, that's not who I am. And like, where do I see myself here? Um, and so this idea of like um, expansion and the conversations that you would have with those expansion if you're including those kinds of, like if you're including diverse um, audiences of artists, into the classroom means that the students like myself who was studying it can understand that this field is for them and not feel like it's uh, exclusionary or um, isolating. And I really think that mm -hmm. that comes back into the way that we see organizations. So, you know, INSICA, for instance, is an organization that is, you know, our national organization about ceramics and, you know, for going there and feeling like, is this a community for me? Am I included in this? So, um, you know, I have the education, I'm making the work, I'm, in, you know, I'm making, having these, um, I'm trying to build community myself, but like, where's the acknowledgement um, in mm -hmm. academia of these students, so. Yeah, I think that's important. Representation is very critical to getting people involved and getting people interested. So I'm glad that you both can speak to that and how that's affected your careers. So, awesome. I think now we're gonna start walking around the space and really looking at some of the individual pieces. So although Ernest is not here, we're gonna start with this piece by Ernest Snell. This piece is called Now I Remember. And all of the pieces in this show are gonna be ceramic works, uh, even though they have different materials. This one is stoneware clay. And so this one reminds me of the face jugs produced in the mid 1800s and later by often enslaved uh, African-Americans. So you can see the exquisite detail that's on the mouth area as well as the eyes. And so, let's just take one second. I heard we're having uh, some technical difficulties. So just one second, please. All right, I think we're back. Thank you for bearing with us, folks. 
So as I was saying about this exhibition, the are uh, about this particular work, um, it's very reminiscent of the face jugs produced in the mid 1800s. So if you focus in on the mouth here, you can see there's quite a bit of detail. And it's kind of hard to tell if he's excited, if he's hungry, if he's laughing, you know, there's so much on his mind. And as we go further up on the sculpture, you can see all of the carvings and paintings hand done by Ernest that are supposed to give you kind of a glimpse into the figure's mind. And I love the abstraction. You can't really tell what he's thinking, but you can see faces and colors and symbols and all of that just really comes together and really makes you think, you know, what's on his mind? What thoughts are being projected by him? What thoughts are being projected onto him? There's really just a lot to unpack with this work. And that's definitely why I wanted to start off with this piece. Definitely one of my favorite works by Ernest. And it's just a very lively piece. So next piece that we're gonna take a look at is Tammy's piece, Always and Forever, uh, Forever, Ever. And this is number 12. There's a series of these works um, that Tammy has created. So as you can see, there are lots of um, cones that make up this piece. And if you look closely, you can see that there are maps and different designs on each of the pieces. So Tammy, these pieces visually reference many recognizable objects and imagery. I know there's a connection to different structures of power such as the Papacy and the Ku Klux Klan. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yes, well, the um, Always and Ever series is an ongoing series where I'm thinking about the way that um, kind of mundane objects can, um, you know, devoid of their function can represent these um, other ways of like looking or thinking about power structures, but also like what are the other historical or cultural um, references that we have when we're like looking at an object. So the idea of like the object having kind of an innate um, like history or an innate power within itself, right? So we are visual people and we see like constant symbols that are reused over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. So I started to make this work once I moved uh, here to Texas um, from, um, I moved to Austin from Seattle. And I really had to think about like moving from um, from moving north to south. And partly of like my, you know, hesitation is that both my parents were part of the Northern migration in the fifties. And mm -hmm. um, my mom would always tell me the story about, you know, she left her small town in Mississippi because she couldn't even work at the five and dime there. Right. And so this idea yeah. of like leaving um, a place of comfort, a place of your family to move um, from a southern rural area to a, like a, a northern big metropolis where they moved to both met in Chicago. Um, and the things that you felt like you were going to gain from that and the things that you kind of lost. So I think it was the first, you know, it's not the first time, but it was one time, it was a time when I thought of my parents in, um, a, in the context of a historical period of the Great Migration, which is like six million people moving from like 1910 to 1970, and thinking about how the ramifications of that affects uh, me not only personally but Black Americans today. So when we are looking at the makeup of urban cities uh, like Philadelphia, New York, DC, Detroit, um, things like that, like where are these populations? And a lot of the Black populations are going to harken back either their second generation or third generation to Southern um, states like Mississippi or Georgia, or Louisiana or Texas, so on and so forth. Um, so it really made me start to think about the um, putting the these kind of familial narratives that were specific to me into a wider context and then visually thinking about how to do that within my own work. And so my own work is always, um, you know, since post undergraduate has taken kind of mundane objects that are industrially made and then removing them from function and then recreating them in um, porcelain or in ceramics so that, you know, they are um, this, these new kind of objects. So this one is specifically um, number 12 and I'm introducing the symbol of badges and thinking of badges of like where, like who wears them, where do they come from, what are those symbols that are related to badges, um, and thinking of it as a, another symbol of power, right? Um, and mm -hmm. that's, it was really kind of interesting because thinking of the fact that, uh, 
why do why are police badges uh, worn over the hearts? Why are they in this the formation of stars? Uh, what's the significance? And it goes back to medieval knights who were wearing um, their like symbols of uh, their badges that would identify them of like who their allegiance was to. And so thinking about something that's really old into something that we're still looking today and then how that transformation of um, ideas or like, like symbolism comes to play. And then why the star specifically? And we goes back to like much earlier societies where we think of the star as a symbol of protection. So like, you know, as we think about uh, religion and we go back to our pagan roots, like these things keep getting repeated over and over and over again. And why are they repeated? And what is the context from which they are now? So at one time thinking about this, the symbol as not only identification, um, symbols of power, but also symbols of people who are um, supposed to be for protection, for protection of other groups. But is that the original intent of the organization? So I'm kind of playing that along with um, maps of places that I have lived. Um, I've lived, um, you know, in different parts of the country and in each of those country has not been perfect. So whether it's the, the <laughs> South, the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest, you know, with the, thing, the commonality, there's racism everywhere, guys. So yeah. just thinking about like these structures and why is that like the structures of power are everywhere, right? And so how does it include um, or manifest itself into our kind of um, our everyday lives? So. I could talk on, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That was a really rich background on this piece. And it helps me to lead into my next question, which, you know, you talk a lot about your fami uh, familial relationship to this piece. It makes me wonder, you know, is there a certain event or time in history that you define as kind of the end of Black history and the beginning of living history? You know, considering the Great Migration, it sounds like something that was so far away, yet it's something that your own family has gone through. So what would you kind of define as the past versus the present? Yeah, I, I don't think of history that way. I think the all history is living history because it's impactful to us today, right? So mm -hmm. just thinking about, for instance, that badge, the symbol of the badge, we're talking about the like medieval times, but we have that symbol today. So I think of kind of, um, and I think there's a danger of us thinking of it's a long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my parents were uh, they were traveling back to visit their families um, pre segregation. So they were, you know, go, you know, if they were take the train, then um, the train pre segregation when they got to Cairo, Illinois, um, the train carts would go back to being segregated for them to continue to Tennessee. That was a long time ago, wasn't like, you know? So um, yeah. I, I, I don't think of it, I don't really think of history that way. And I think that part of the tensions that we have and the politics as we have is that if we can say it's history and it's behind us, we don't have to think about how it do, how we deal with it today and how it continues to kind of influence us. So I think of all kind of like, you know, um, all history as like living history because it's impactful and that we continue not to learn from past mistakes. I think it's because that, because we want to put it in um, our rearview mirror without really critically mm -hmm. thinking about it, acknowledging it, um, and making adjustments um, or considerations for the future. So, I mean, that's how I got to feel about it. I think specifically um, when, you know, I'm talking about, you know, my family's history in terms of Black Americans, um, I'm talking about it as Americans. We are Americans. And even though this is a country that has, you um, you know, consistently try to deny um, African Americans who are descendants of enslaved here um, citizenship. We are citizens, right? And thinking about the way that our um, labor, our like uh, joy, our like stories, our like um, the things that we have brought to the culture, um, and are American. And so when I'm talking about like history. I'm not talking about Black history. I'm talking about American history because African-Americans, Black people are Americans. So, Awesome. I think that's a great way of putting it and really defining how all these things interweave and come together. So thank you for explaining it. Um, next, I want to focus on Ernest Snell's work. So on this table here, we have a collection of sculptures. All of these are very figural pieces, which is why I chose to display them on this table. 
And I like the fact that the table is across from some of his other works, which are, they're all untitled. We have an untitled bowl and drum on this side. So with these works, you can really see that whether the works are thrown on the wheel or sculpted um, by hand or with tools, Ernest really leaves his impression and visual signature on each piece. So the detail is really amazing in these forms and it almost feels like the figures are alive and, and moving and the, there's such a rich narrative that even though it's not written down, it, you know, you can make up your own story and really see what he's going for. So I just really love having all these pieces that bounce off of each other and it's very unclear if they're all living in this universe or some alternative universe. There's just this magical, fantastical element to all of his works that I really love to see. And so as we're talking about process and you know, the different ways that you can sculpt ceramics, I really wanna draw more attention to GA's work, Journey to the West. These pieces are inspired by moving boxes and they have a very fun, you know, arrangement of color to them. And there's just something very whimsical about these works. And GA, it would be really great if you could tell us a little bit more about this work and how it all came together. Uh, I think this piece is mainly, I try to combine uh, technology and uh, like contemporary aspect of it because I was, I was using the laser cutter line in hand drawing with a zip tie. So zip tie kind of represents kind of temporary situation because I, I'm moving so many times and then I never throw the box. So because I'm ready for moving <laughs> already mm -hmm. or I'm thinking about oh, where should I moving next? So I think moving box and kind of packing tape is always with me. So I think zip tie is really important um, uh, element for this piece so kind of is really also when you look at this piece like further you cannot feel which one is zip tie or which line is hand drawing and laser etching line because i try to kind of blending each other so also one of the most important uh, element will be like using kind of map so mm -hmm. when i was later my friend asked me, where are you from all the time? Like, and then I say South Korea and they, they, because at that time, like no BTS, you know, no K drama, <laughs> no K beauty. So they really confused where is South Korea? And then I tried to explain South Korea is in between China and Japan. And they, they knew where is the China and Japan, but not South Korea. So uh, I just keep saying South Korea. It's really hard to explain where is South Korea. So yeah. uh, I threw them into confusion right away. I just keep saying South Korea. And I, oh, and then I realized, and then I show them a world of map and then pointing out the spot of South Korea. And then they figured it out and then asked me a bunch of questions. So I think art and human geography has long been interwined. As, I think as early as 14,000 years ago, people scratch mark into rocks that appear uh, to be at once art and uh, cartography. So in my opinion, mm -hmm. maybe it's really fundamental tool for how we navigate the world around us. Uh, map show where we go and where do you, where we wanna go and where we'll be. So I think using the map and transferring to abstract lines are the way to describe distance and to capture my experience and my memory and my story between the East and West. Awesome. And then on the map, some of the countries are filled in with color. Are those mm -hmm. all places that you've personally lived or you know, can you speak a little bit more to the color choice? Yes, I think that's a really good kind of good point because I didn't apply color all the uh, surface because I think you can see a certain spot has only few color and different color. So, mm -hmm. I and I think uh, the spot with the color is I live in there or I have some experience or memory in there. So I try to kind of organizing by different color. Nice. I think it's really interesting that both you and Tammy 
have work that references and shows maps on the works. You know, going into this show, I didn't know that both of you would have that similarity. And I think it's really great to see that both of you are taking something similar, but making completely different work out of it. So it's really nice to see that together. So moving on to some of your other work over here on this table, we have Little Moments, Big Memories, and Flowers Are Like Friends. They bring color to our world. So looking at these two pieces, uh, these are relatively new pieces, right? You created these last month, correct? Yes. So when I was first looking at these pieces, I was looking at Little Moments, Big Memories, and I noticed the shape being that it has two pieces kind of a round top and a round bottom. It reminded me of the double gourd shape that's seen in a lot of traditional Korean ceramics. Are you inspired at all by traditional Korean pottery? And if so, how does it really factor into your practice? Yeah, it, I think most of people think I made just like one piece, but actually I made a separate piece, uh, bottom and top piece. And uh, I think for this piece is really important to think about traditional Korean vessel because the mm -hmm. pure white porcelain vessel and moon jar uh, were popular in Joseon dynasty. It's so back in the day, like 1392 to 1910 area. So the basic type of uh, porcelain jar was really plain wear with a uh, pure white surface. But some uh, piece uh, were partially decorated with carved or inlay design or paint with a cobalt blue, iron brown, or copper red. At this time, the shape and pure white porcelain like express like beauty, like really pure beauty and mm -hmm. the confusion idea of Joseon nobility and uh, also try to reflect the culture of Joseon dynasty directly. So I really want to use this reference to uh, represent the idea of contemporary ceramic through the investigating of traditional Korean aesthetic in ceramic. Also, I believe uh, ceramic is a mirror of the time we live in and reflects our society and culture. Because back in the day, there is a class as well. Also, they have uh, not. They also they have the discrimination as well because you know they have hierarchy class. So yeah. when I think about history and contemporary, we still deal with the uh, uh, stereotype and like mm -hmm. discrimination. So I really want to bring it up that idea to my recent work. Awesome! I think it's really beautiful. So going forward, are you going to hope to make more vessels like these or? You playing around with scale, making larger or smaller works. You know what can we expect to see from you? I know you're going to be joining us in March for your residency here at the mm -hmm. craft center. So, what kind of stuff should we expect to see from you going forward? Yeah, I think when you guys think about like discrimination or you know uh, figure it out identity, it's a little bit dark and deeper subject. So, uh, I really want to. Uh, I kind of I don't want to make really dark dark version of my work because I personally I'm really I really like humorous as well like you know fun I think I have to make fun thing when I'm working with clay so mm -hmm. I think I want to bring I, I want to keep making kind of Korean vessel shape but not exactly like the you know, same shape maybe I can modify with a you know little bit uh, contemporary way, but kind of I'm um, mm -hmm. I'm really enjoying to making two piece. So top is really con contemporary, like shape, and bottom can be you know I can bring it up some reference from like vessel or moon jar or something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, you talk about kind of taking this heavy subject matter and adding humor and you know bright colors and these fun images. You know, how do you, how are you able to do this? Now, this is for both you and Tammy. How are you able to tackle such dark subject matter in your work and not be overwhelmed by some of the emotion and some of the history behind it? Is it difficult? I think for me, it's not 
difficult because, you know, I think, I don't know, for me, I just like, you know, I really, really like the illustrator, like, you know, drawing style. So like for this piece, uh, I aim for purity and take an innocent with a playful child perspective where approaching things because like childhood memory and experience has developed aspect of who am who am I now. Also, mm -hmm. I play like I play with the familiar and unfamiliar. Uh, for example, I use abstraction to confuse the viewer and blur boundary by using laser etching line and hand drawing line and zip tie. So maybe ambiguity, ambiguity and maybe uh, maybe putting more like color or maybe fun element will be uh, good to approaching, you know, to make little dark subject for me. Okay, thank you. And Tammy? Yeah, I don't know if I think of them as, as dark necessarily. I just think of them as kind of like factually true. Um, and mm -hmm. there are elements of that, for instance, if my parents, my mom doesn't leave her Southern, um, doesn't leave her Mississippi town and my dad doesn't leave Memphis and they don't meet in Chicago, I'm not bored, right? So it's really mm -hmm. just thinking about um, the way, I think of these narratives as like the way of, um, you know, the structure, but also thinking about the things that are, um, kind of um, the other things that happen within a life, right? And so that the, um, like the ability for me to be able to, for instance, you know, move around the country um, in a way that my parents can never do, right? So um, once mm -hmm. I started having a lot of exhibitions, um, if it was like a solo show, I would kind of think like, do I want to ship the work or do I want to drive the work? Um, and um, I would have relatives, be, you know, my, my parents and my mom, my uh, parents, but specifically more like the female um, relatives would be like, aren't you, you know, like you're driving all of these places? Are you scared? I mean, I would drive from like Chicago to like Seattle or Baltimore and, you know, and I really thought this was more about gender and, and to an extent it was about gender. But then I realized too that like they lived in a time where they did not know where they could stay. Like yeah. if they could go into a hotel and book a hotel and, was not safe. Turned, yeah. and not be turned away, right? And it took me a while to realize like, oh, that's what they're saying. It's like, they, they're they kind of amazed that like, and they're like, you're so brave. And like, oh, I have this opportunity that they have not had, right? But then, then mm -hmm. you look at also in the places where there are like closed doors or things that you have to deal with that you wish were, you know, kind of of the past. So it's this like, looking forward and then looking back as well. Um, and also I just like the, this idea of uh, looking at objects and how context changes over time. So while mm -hmm. the cones, um, you know, will reference things like the Ku Klux Klan and like the Brothers of the Nazarene for like, uh, which is like they have festivals still in um, Brazil and also in Spain and you can, you know, see them during that time and it's kind of like hearkening. But the thing about this idea of like pageantry, like, you know, people wearing these outfits um, and um, engaging in this idea of fraternity and the, like it becomes absurdist and humorous, right? Like why mm -hmm. the, the way that you think of them having power is only because they have tried to like um, create this through um, being anonymous, being within a group, um, the symbolism of that. I like how uh, to think about like, it's also so the dunce cap and how the dunce yeah. cap we think of um, not being like not intelligent or being in trouble. Um, and then also like the, there was like this group of philosophers, there was a philosopher called um, John T. Um, uh, Scotus, who his fo his followers would wear this cone hat on their heads, and they thought it made them seem smarter as intellectual. So I like these things where we like um, smart but not smart, um, like m you know, kind of like murderous group, but also the church, you know. So I think that yeah. that's really interesting as we think about like objects and the power of objects and magical thinking, and with that. So um, there's a lot of absurdity, but then also in ceramics, um, I'm saying I'm sure like. <laughs> you know, would agree with me is that like the uh, ceramics is such a, like there's so much problem solving and experimenting and testing and humbling in the material. So you're always trying to figure out like, this is what I know it can do. 
what can I make it, how can I push it further? Um, and is there going to be failure in that? And then if there is, you pick yourself up and you keep going. So it's a consistent challenge of like the idea and then how to realize the idea in this material. And so I think that I, while I do work in other materials, it's a material that like constantly challenges me. Um, and mm -hmm. because there's always a new problem to kind of solve. So, um, and then also just the tactility and making things that are three-dimensional that take up space within the world is something that um, I find really engaging. Awesome. So I wanna ask GA one more question about this piece or these two pieces before we move on. And, you know, we talk about the lightness that's brought to the pieces when we have all of the illustrations. So when you're creating these pieces, do you plan beforehand what kind of illustrations and drawings that you want on the pieces or do you make the vessel first and then decide what kind of images you wanna put on the surface? Uh, I think for this piece, uh, I made two separate piece, bottom and top piece with a slab and coil technique, um, coil technique together. And then uh, I think the most challenging will be because I made separately. So I tried mm -hmm. to measure, you know, the top and bottom. Uh, I have to measure really, really carefully. So because when you fire, there is a shrinkage. So the clay yes. will be smaller size. So I have to measure that that part is the most important thing. And then I apply uh, a white slip on the surface to make cleaner and wider. So in order drawing later. So before bisque fire, I make two separate piece and then applying the white sleeve. And then uh, after bisque fire, I was drawing with the uh, underglaze. So uh, for drawing part, I never kind of plain. I never plain. So I think when I look at the surface, I just, you know, pop up some of the memory and then when I was young, I really, really loved Toy Story or Pink Panda or, you know, the cartoon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, I just keep popping up some idea of like cartoon or memory with my friend and family in my head. And then I just drawing directly on the surface. Nice. I'm really taking a look at this piece and I'm just noticing here that the um, figures reading, uh, is it a Korean book yeah. or? Yeah, or that's Korean or something. Yeah, that I don't know. You guys have this kind of story, but I think the the uh, that book was my favorite like book when I was young. So Rabbit and Turtle. I don't know. You guys have this kind of story because you know mm -hmm. Rabbit is a little bit you know lazy, and then Turtle. Oh almost. yeah, the tortoise yeah. and the hare is is how yeah yeah oh, okay yeah. So that one that one was my favorite. You know. The story so when I was and then like rabbit is one of my favorite you know animal so when I look at the animal always chasing or take a picture but it's so fast and then I never you know I never <laughs> play with a rabbit in my life but you know rabbit was always you know my favorite animal so yeah I think when I was young it was so innocent and there is no winner or loser I never think about yeah. you know who is the first or you know last one? So I think childhood memory is really important. There is no, I don't know, for me, there is no class or you know, no discrimination at all when I was like, even when I I'm from Korea and then my friend, you know, she was the, you know, she's American, but we never thought about, you know, we have difference. We just like friend. We always talk about book, cartoon, or always as playing with playing without playing with animal or playing outside. That's why I really, really like to draw with this kind of child, child, childish kind of you know, uh, child perspective uh, illustration for me. Yeah, I think that's really relatable. I think we all can remember doodling in a notebook or doodling mm -hmm. in class, and then. You know, that story of the tortoise and hare is such an old story that so many people yeah. remember. So it's really great to have that connection in the work. Yeah, even so I can thank you for sharing. Yeah, even when I was young, I cannot speak English when I was in uh, other country. And then I think one of my friends asked me, do you want to go outside? Even I can understand. 
I just look at her and then she said, mm -hmm. go outside. And then still I can understand. And then, you know, she tried to kind of drawing, you know, and then, oh, I, I got it right away. So I think kind of drawing and then doodling is a really good communicate, you know, like tool between, you know, friends or I think it was a really fun memory for me. Definitely. I think art is a great way to cross language barriers and cultural divides and, you know, find commonalities among different groups of people. So the next piece that I want to look at is actually two pieces, and these are the last ones that we're going to see in the exhibition. These are both by Tammy Rubin. Um, this taller one here is called Shoe, and the one on the taller pedestal back here is The Answer is Horrible slash Rhetorical. So Tammy, clearly we can see that there's a lot of work and, you know, as you were saying earlier, trial and error when it comes to creating pieces like this. Can you speak a little bit to how you decided to make these pieces and then a little bit about the process of, you know, actually making them? Yes, well, um, you know, as part of my practice, I've always kind of started with like collections of, of, of objects that I see that, um, for whatever reason I become really kind of enamored with or um, just become really intriguing to me. And so uh, this, these um, sculptures are made out of ball moss and ball moss is um, a kind of a native Texas uh, moss. And it was interesting to think about like, uh, when I usually think about like Southern moss, I think about the Spanish moss, right? Which is kind of like mm -hmm. you know, long and wispy and some sort of antebellum over like, you know, these plantational houses and things like that. And so these, um, when I walk across my campus or um, specifically, I would be like, see these little green tough balls. And then you both, I like both see them and then don't see them. But then they would take over a complete tree and it'd be seen like that they were some sort of parasite that were killing these trees. And it was just really kind of intriguing to me because I like, well, why do, like, why are we not taking care of these, this parasitic plant? Um, only to find out it's an air plant. So it doesn't actually take any nutrients or anything away from trees. And they're not even fully adhered to um, like branches. So if there's like a rain or a wind, they just like fall down. And so it, it, it became like a metaphorical for me to think of like, uh, external versus internal. So things that we visually think of are external um, um, like issues or like um, um, ways of thinking like there's an external problem when it's really an internal problem, I guess is the best way to put mm -hmm. it. Um, and so um, I was thinking about that, like the trees that are kind of dying or are like sick, that is where the ball moss is gonna gather um, because it's just out of kind of opportunity. Um, I also thought of them as like these, like these tendrils are so, they're like together by one membrane. And so then you have mm -hmm. these tendrils that are right next to each other, but they're not actually connected to each other. So um, this, you know, I started to get intrigued by this specifically during um, our uh, previous president's um, when he was running for president. And there was a lot of conversation about um, not only with um, his presidency or his campaign of like racism coming back. We've never seen this, like, you know, people being very surprised that in social media about um, racism or sexism or homophobia. Like we just, you know, just seem, people seem to be constantly surprised um, and thinking as if some sort of external source has come in and brought these issues or brought these things to bear. And it's like, no, these things have always been here. Um, maybe mm -hmm. we see more video evidence of these things, but it's always happened. Maybe people are saying the quiet part out loud, but it's not external. It's part of our country, right? Like this is not something yeah. that's externally happening. This is something that's internal. So anyway, I was kind of thinking about that and um, they became kind of a secondary or maybe a conversation in with the always and forever uh, because they started with each one of these having a internal cast cone in the inside. And so mm -hmm. um, um, taking that ball moss and directly dipping it into colored porcelain and building these forms um, but onto this um, bisque, um, por bis bisque cones. And what happens is that there's so much weight and pressure from the dipped 
porcelain, right? These become really, really mm-hmm. heavy. And so as I am building them with steel, and then I also put um, dip cotton and twine and other organic material. Yeah, we can see all sorts of stuff here. All sorts of stuff, steel, wool. Um, what happens is that the I don't know what it's going to look like until it's fired because the pressure mm-hmm. and the like the weight is going to distort the cone that's underneath it. It's going to really shift and it's going to kind of tilt and uh, where things are going to settle are going to be um, surprising to, to me. So this idea of like process and the thing about like this like transformation and the fact that as these are fired, the organic materials are now burned away. So what we're really looking at is a skeleton or the ghost of those materials. And what are they now? So like, what does it become now? So the original is there, mm-hmm. but it's not there. Um, it's, um, you may see the cone underneath, you may not. Um, and then with the answer is rhetorical, this is one where there is not um, kind of like a cone, but they become- Okay, like yeah, a, I didn't see the cone here. Yeah, for this one, there is no cone, but it becomes like very kind of like bodily. And I feel like almost like, a, you know, other organic things as if we're thinking about coral or it becomes like mm-hmm. some sort of alien. Um, it becomes this other kind of creature that starts to kind of form. Um, and there is a, I think with both bodies of work, there is a play between like, my things aren't la- make large. I want you to be able to like across the room, you're like, what is that? That seems somewhat familiar, but you're not sure. And you have to get close and to really examine. And so though you're both like um, um, pulled forward, but also kind of um, repelled, right? So if your first reference for the always and forever is the Ku Klux Klan, you're probably gonna, you might be compelled like repelled by that work, right? Um, but depending mm-hmm. on this, but looking at the surface, you're gonna be, um, hopefully you're gonna be pulled in. So there's, there's like this real like kind of push pull. Um, and also thinking about the idea of like um, things that we, uh, that we call quote unquote beauty and things that we call quote unquote grotesque kind of sit at the same level where you both want to look. Like you wanna equally look, at something that you think is like, you know, cherry blossoms, but also you want to look at roadkill. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're doing the same things. Like you want to look even when you don't want to look. And so kind of pushing with that, uh, thinking about that and then also tactility um, as itself and transformation. So I really thought of these as like kind of um, chaotic and uh, accessible, but chaotic thinking about these like knots and like tangles, um, thinking about like internal and external perceptions. Um, physical, mental pressure and distortions through the process itself. And this work is all about, you know, is through abstraction. So these become much more mm-hmm. um, in some ways abstracted forms than some of the other work. And I really like that play as well. So like they don't exist without the process. They don't look like what they look like without the process. Um, and because I'm dealing with um, porcelain, that uh, slip cast porcelain, there is an immediacy that has to happen with the work. So there's only so much time that uh, when you cast them, you can leave things, you know, before they become okay. too dry. And so that becomes, for me, it's like all, any kind of like research that I'm doing or references or things that I'm looking at or reading or listening to or whatever. Once I go in the studio, it has to be more about, um, I have to both take that with me and also kind of like push it away so that I can work with the clay in the way that like in its, um, in its time frame, in the way that it wants to work. And so then I make these really much like, kind of quicker um, decisions and um, these are the results. So I really love this idea of like kind of the, the, the abstraction that happens through these, even though I'm dealing with similar themes um, in other, um, other bodies of work as well. So, and starting awesome. with something I'm real, really like starting with yeah. the real, there's a real thing that exists and then how is it transformed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love looking at these. Every time I come back to them, I see something that I hadn't seen before. So they definitely pull you in and, you know, you really want to walk around and, and look at every aspect. So I like what you said about how they're so different from always and forever. And that's part of why I chose these works is I tried to get a nice variety of work from each artist. All of you are so talented and can do so many different things. You know, most people, when they think of ceramic work, they think of cups and functional wear and vases, which of course are, are still great examples of ceramics, but I really liked how boundary pushing all of the works in this show are, particularly these ball moss pieces 
and then GA's uh, Journey to the West are all really out there examples of what you can do with ceramic art. So thank you both. Um, I think now it's time to turn over to the audience and see what kind of questions everybody else has. So I'm curious to see what everybody's been thinking about the work. So um, we'll see what kind of questions we've gotten. Okay, there was an audience question wanting to wanting GA to elaborate a bit on the illustrations and the cartoons that are on both of your works. I know we talked a bit about the ones on this table, but maybe you could speak a little bit more to the faces and the images that are on the cubes over here on Journey to the West. Uh, I think, can you guys see that kind of one of the uh, panel on the, there is a lot of like face image in the high school. When I was in uh, China, I graduated high school and then I moved to China four years. And then when I was China, uh, the bicycle was the really, really important transportation. So, but when I was in Korea, I only ride bicycle in the park, not I never used I never used the bicycle for transportation in Korea because in Korea we have a lot of taxi, bus, subway. So, you know, I think for me bicycle was just like, you know, like hobby or something like that. But when I moved to China, everybody riding bicycle every day. Mm -hmm. So I think the that's why I put the bicycle. It was really kind of good memory and then learning new uh, culture aspect from other country. So I think I put the bicycle over there and then uh, I use a lot of different face from a different face image because when I uh, move or when I live in different city and country, there's so many people, you know, <laughs> like, you know, even you cannot remember or you cannot count, you know, there's so many mm -hmm. people around the, us so I just you know try to play with you know the the human face around my piece and I think also I don't know you can see there is the airplane or there is a ship or something like that so all the image is from a uh, base on my experience and kind of my one of like most important part of my journey. Wow, well, thank you for sharing that with us. It's a really great um, explanation because I didn't look too far into seeing the bicycle. I saw the boats and the airplane, but I didn't really notice the bicycle. There's just so much on each side of these pieces. It's like a maze really looking through and kind of trying to understand where you've come from and where you've gone, where you've been and where you're going. So thank you for sharing. It's very personal, but still um, really great to know. Thank you. Awesome. So I don't know. I think we have another question. The one request is before we end things, if we could do more close-ups on pieces, particularly earnest, so we'll be able to see some details there. And then the next question is, how do you protect personal autonomy and your story when making work for the public? Okay, so to repeat that question, uh, I think this is for both artists. How do you protect um, personal identity and autonomy when uh, making your works? For the public. For the public. Mm, I don't. Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, um, there, I don't think that there's anything that I'm making that, um, I guess if I'm understanding the question, is it asking specifically how to protect the identity of people that we are alluding to? Or, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll, what I'll say is that like the work that I'm making are experiences that start with myself. Um, and involve mm -hmm. other people, but they're, I'm not the only individual, right? And so as I think about making the work, it's like, it's 
most likely going to go out into the world and then how is it um um how does it relate to other like um narratives and um histories mm -hmm. beyond myself for me um so i always start with the personal but i want the work to be um kind of more um expansive so awesome and ga and uh in my in my opinion, when I work in my work, it's really personal because all like uh, imagery is based on my memory and my experience. So it's really, really personal piece. And then uh, when I talk about my work, I always talk about, you know, identity and then moving from East and West is a little bit bigger like concept, but actually like I totally agree with Tammy because I like I start when I uh, working with uh, making art, I always start from my personal like stuff, personal story mm -hmm. as well. Awesome. And then I know Ernest isn't here with us to answer the same question, but uh, a lot of the figures in his work are not specific people, but the idea of certain people. So particularly in uh, this image, we have this old woman who the idea is that she's a woman that you could see anywhere. You may have seen her before. She may be in the background of different settings and just one of those people that tend to blend into the background. So it's very interesting for him to have sculpted somebody who's thought of as the background and not the focus of the work. So when thinking about personal identity, um, obviously I can't answer for him, but I think that using intentionally vague figures, factors into how he represents both himself and then other people that he attempts to represent. So I think that is all of the questions that we have. Um, I'll definitely give Tammy and GA a second to add anything else, if there's anything else you'd like to say about your work. Um, Jay, do you is anything else? Do you have any uh, shows or anything coming up? Or are you going to do the residency? And then um, what else is going on with you? Uh, actually, I have two exhibitions during the NCCA on March 16 to 19 in Sacramento. And I'm pretty busy, <laughs> but I'm really, really, I don't know, like making or touching clay always make me happy. So it's like, you know, uh, I'm really happy to meet you guys and then talking about my work and share my idea is make me really happy as well. So just keep working and then I'm really excited to be a residence artist at Houston Contemporary Craft Center. This is my yeah, yeah one of the my excitement like you know news. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to have another project that I'm coming up in uh, Houston in a couple of months. So I'm going to be in the um, at Project Row House round 53. And so, oh, okay. um, yeah, definitely come out and see that work. It'll be definitely um, you'll be able to see some installation work as I'll have one of the Project Row Houses to com um, completely uh, transform. And uh, that's going to be uh, March 12th through June uh, 5th. And then if you are in New York, um, mid-March through April, I'll have a show at a gallery called uh, C24 Gallery. Um, and then if, you are all, if you're in Dallas, um, I'm represented by Gallery Urbane and they currently have um, a kind of a back show up from the work that they showed at Untitled in uh, Miami. So um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad that both of your works are going to be included in this show since you've got stuff going on all over the nation. We're really honored to have your work and really honored that you could be here with us today to answer some questions about the work. So big thanks to GA and Tammy. I really appreciate having you. And I guess that concludes our event for the day. Okay. So and thank, thank you, you all Cindy. for attending. And thank you, Sydney, thank for you. all the coordination and things that you've done and um, planning out the exhibition. It looks really amazing. Uh, and also want to say thanks to Clay Houston again and the uh, Houston Center for Crafts. So. Thank you, Sydney. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for putting a lot of effort for this show. And then thank you for the tour and thank you for the, you know, Clay Houston as well. Thank you so much.
Awesome. Um, thank you so much, all of you for attending and we'll see you at our next event.